it's a very heartwarming case, let's face it. Uh, somebody goes to jail for 11 years, he gets, not only does he get exonerated, but, you know, he gets together with the person who sent him to jail, they become friends, they write a book together, they travel the country promoting the book, it's great. But I think what's really important to keep in mind is that all this happened only because of perseverance and great good luck. It happened that the Innocent Project took an interest in uh, Ronald Cotton's case. It happened that there were many people around who uh, worked very hard to get the DNA tests, which is a very hard thing to do after the fact, to do all the other things that eventually resulted in the exoneration. Most people who are probably languishing in jail and who are innocent uh, are likely not that lucky and or do not have people uh, persevering for them as much as they did here. So, but for uh, this perturbation and great good luck, the story would have been different. Cotton would have spent the rest of his life in prison and 54 years, uh, and his story. So, um, the title of this talk is uh, When Should Juries Be Told About Human Perception and Memory? But I hope that I've provided you some information about uh, when it's important for juries to have available to them. Uh, scientific information about human perception and human memory that they can use as a tool to carry out their job of, provide, of, uh, to, of, of coming to a verdict uh, who's right and who's wrong, whether the person on trial is uh, guilty or not. So uh, this happens when somebody uh, in court, a witness, uh, points to the defendant and says, that's him, I'm absolutely positive, I'll never forget that case as long as I live. What is the jury to make of this witness making the statement with such confidence and fervor? Uh, the jury's job is to decide whether this is a reliable identification, whether it was based on a reasonable opportunity for the memory, for the witness to have uh, memorized the face of the person they saw from the time. Uh, and uh, that was accompanied by uh, a relatively unbiased identification procedure, uh, or whether it's unreliable, whether it is falls into the category of cases that I've been telling you about, in which uh, a witness doesn't have a very good opportunity to see who it was uh, who it and or uh, participate in a biased or unreliable identification procedure, thereby. Uh, lining up uh, with a memory that is strong, uh, confident that they use as a basis for uh, identifying the person in court and likely sending him or her uh, to jail. So that's the job. That's when the uh, jury should be told about human perception and memory. Um, thanks for listening. You know, that's, that's a funny, it's funny you should bring that up. Um, I, I've always had this beef with exactly that terminology. Um, police use suspects in two ways. It creates a pretty great deal of good. They, they use it the way I've been using, uh, in which the, a suspect is really a suspect. You don't know whether he or she is the person who's been the crime now. They also use it to literally mean the real person so you'll often read in the police report, the suspect committed the assault and then the assault and then ran off. I mean, you know, if I were God, I would make everybody say, the perpetrator committed the assault and uh, ran off. Because uh, using the term suspect in this weird way uh, can lead to all kinds of linguistic mystery. Um, so uh, it, it gets worse though, because usually in police reports, once the police have a suspect, they'll stop referring to the, the perpetrator, the perpetrator or suspect. They'll just refer to it as by the name of the guy who's the suspect. So the police report will say Mr. Jackson, you know, assaulted his manager and then did this and that. And Mr. Jackson was, you know, assuming a priori that uh, the guy who's just the suspect was actually the perpetrator. You know, it's like whatever happened to 
and assume them until uh, proven guilty. So that, that's what I, I mean, even call defense attorneys. Um, that one happens to be in this room. But uh, occasionally, defense attorneys have said, have, have told me about a case, and they said something like, so what happened is that Mr. Jackson was, you know, assaulted Mr. Spanish, and I said, well, then, when you say Mr. Jackson assaulted Mr. Spanish, are you saying that everybody agrees that Jackson says he was there, or just arguing with somebody else, and then the guy's sitting there like, no, 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 sorry, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant to say is, there's a guy who assaulted Mr. Spanish, and goes, right? It's a very easy, it seems to be a very easy linguistic trap to fall into. Um, it can certainly influence witnesses, um, used uh, in the wrong way, I'm sure it can influence jurors as well. Very bad, thanks for thinking about it. Other questions, yeah. Well, if you could help me uh, walk me through, I can see how this would apply in this Chicago case. We had a um, famous Chicago scandal uh, torture. And one of the primary witnesses uh, against the police was a man who came out of the police station with very identifiable marks of having a good light, small, um, a duration of say five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, he's able to pick two people out who seem likely to have done given that uh, they're named by other people later. So, so there's a lineup or lineups and he picks out he picks them from photos. He goes through a one shot procedure? Um you'll have to forgive me on that. Okay. Uh, I don't know the never a one shot procedure. I believe that at some point he yeah. Um, however, he picks a third guy who contends he was up in Wisconsin at the time that the shot was. Um, how would you explain that? Um, so he picked three people. Yes. And how many actual torturers were there?